This is the brand new 2019 MacBook Pro, which yes, looks the same as the 2018, 2017, and 2016 models. And then this is the 2019 iMac, which also looks the same as the 2017, 2015, 2014, 2013, 2012, or even 2011, 2010, and 2009 models as well, if you just take a look at the iMac from the front. So yes, Apple doesn't like changing the design of their products that much. Also, yes, Apple does save a ton in manufacturing year by year by doing this. But Apple does update the hardware inside their Macs quite often, almost every single year, at least when it comes to the MacBook Pros. And since in 2019, we now have eight core processors in both the iMac as well as the MacBook Pro 15 inch, I wanna see which one is overall the better product. And yes, performance wise, you would think that the iMac is going to be significantly faster, but you'll actually be very surprised when it comes to some of these results. Yeah, this is going to be one very detailed video covering everything you need to know in terms of the iMac 2019 and MacBook Pro 2019. So get those snacks ready, get some drinks ready, and also subscribe and notifications if you wanna see more detailed videos like this one is going to be, especially if you're new to the channel and have the bell icon, please, so that you get notified whenever a brand new video comes out. So now, let's begin. This video is sponsored by Setup. Setup is an alternative to Apple's App Store for the Mac. With more than 150 apps to choose from, Setup gives you everything you need to be creative and stay productive, and their entire collection of apps keeps growing and stays synced across all of your Macs. Try Setup and use any number of the 150 apps completely free for one week using the link below. Okay, so starting off with the design, these two computers couldn't be any more different because, well, one of them is a laptop and the other one's a full desktop computer. However, they're actually not that far away in terms of of the portability. So while yes, you can put your MacBook Pro in your backpack easily and take it anywhere you want, since the iMac is just a screen and not a full tower PC, all you need to take with you is the screen itself, the single power cable, and the fully wireless keyboard and the mouse. And yeah, that's that's pretty much it. You can transport the iMac much easier in your car or even a fairly large bag than you could with a Windows PC. And I do know a few people that work in co-working spaces, one of which actually used to work next to you, um, and he took his iMac to work every single day, pretty much like a laptop. But obviously I wouldn't recommend anyone doing that, but if you wanna do it, it is, it is doable. Now, design-wise, I prefer the MacBook Pro so, so much more. So it's got the space gray look, which the iMac also has, but you have to buy the iMac Pro, which is more than double, so no thanks. But I don't know, the iMac with those massive bezels, which are almost bigger than my entire palm, um, yeah, it looks, it looks ancient. I mean, yes, it still looks better than almost all the other all-in-one PCs out there, but compared to more modern monitors, it looks very, very outdated. Probably by the fact that Apple's been using the exact same design on the front since 2009, yes. For the past 10 years, we've had the exact same design on the front. And it's not just the design of the iMac that's outdated, it's also the accessories. So with the MacBook Pro's third generation design, which we can find on the 2016 and onwards models, the function row keys were actually replaced by the touch bar. And the touch bar is quite cool, as it gives you custom controls in certain apps. Now, even though most of the controls are kind of useless, like, you know, bolding and underlining, which you can do so much quicker by just using keyboard shortcuts, there are some controls, such as in Photoshop for adjusting the brush size or going through the blending modes, which are actually extremely useful to have. Even the trimming controls in Final Cut Pro 10 are really, really useful. And we don't have this on the iMac at all, as Apple hasn't updated a keyboard since 2015, when they introduced the Magic Keyboard 2. However, I do actually prefer the iMac keyboard. It's got way more key travel and feedback than the butterfly key switch that's inside the MacBook Pros. But hey, you can always connect a Magic Keyboard to your MacBook Pro as well, in case you wanna do that. Also, the Magic Mouse that comes with the iMac, it's really, really bad. So it offers zero comfort, so I highly recommend getting a Logitech MX Master 2S, which is, in my opinion, the best mouse for productivity out there. And not only is it really comfortable, but it also gives you gestures for Mac OS. So it also replaces the trackpad. Left the link for that in the description. Now, something that the iMac does offer over the MacBook Pro is the connectivity. The MacBook Pro comes with a headphone jack for Thunderbolt 3 ports, which I'll cover more in a second, uh, but the iMac offers a headphone jack, an SD card reader, four USB 3.0 ports, two Thunderbolt 3 ports, as well as a one gig ethernet port. Now, for most people, the iMac ports are so, so much better, but for me, actually, I need as many Thunderbolt 3 ports as I can get, so I prefer the MacBook Pro ports 
all day. You see, Thunderbolt 3 is the world's fastest consumer connection, offering speeds of up to 40 gigabits per second or 5 gigabytes per second. And it's not only that, but you can also connect high-end uh, accessories in Thunderbolt 3 docks, and you can connect a ton of those accessories using a single port. You can daisy chain accessories via Thunderbolt 3, you can connect something like a 5K monitor uh, using Thunderbolt, or even Apple's upcoming 6K Pro XDR display. But the best part about Thunderbolt is that you can attach an external graphics card, such as an RTX 2080 Ti or a Vega 64 and significantly improve your GPU performance on both the MacBook Pro as well as the iMac. More about that in the performance section of this video. Some really interesting results, by the way. But since we only get two Thunderbolt 3 ports on the iMac, you're quite limited in this regard. So you can have an LG UltraFine 5K connected to one of them uh, and maybe an eGPU to the other one, but I mean, that's it. If you need two 5K monitors, you're out of luck. Um, yeah, the iMac is the only major Mac, by the way, that only has two Thunderbolt 3 ports. The MacBook Pro 13-inch with a touch bar and the 15-inch both have four ports. The iMac Pro also has four ports. And even, yes, even the Mac Mini has four Thunderbolt 3 ports, but the iMac only has two. So overall, because of the design and the portability, and in my case, connectivity as well, I would go design-wise with the MacBook Pro. But then the display is also another big difference between the two. While they're both very, very vibrant and offer full DCI-P3 color gamut coverage, and they also have the exact same brightness at 500 nits, the IMAX display is just so, so much better. So it is a massive 5K, so 5120 by 2880 resolution panel versus the 15 inches 2880 by 1800 resolution panel on the MacBook Pro. And while the pixel density is similar, so we have 217 on the iMac versus 220 on the MacBook Pro, uh, the iMac's display is actually noticeably sharper and clearer. Okay, but that doesn't make sense. Why is that if the PPI is the same? Well, you see, the way Apple's Retina works uh, is that they have a very high resolution display and every four pixels form a virtual pixel, so to say, that's rendered by the UI. So what this means is that for, let's say, a 2000 by 2000 resolution panel, the sharpest Retina image would actually be at 1000 by by 1000 resolutions. So yeah, the scaled or the virtual resolution that you use and you see on the display should always be half of the native resolution of the display panel for the best possible clarity. So in the IMAX case, half of 5120 by 2880 is 2560 by 1440, which actually looks amazing on the 27 inch display. So there's plenty of room to breathe uh, for the apps and icons and text and everything. And yes, the text isn't too small either. On the MacBook Pro, however, since it has a resolution of 2880 by 1800, the true retina scale resolution would actually be half of that. So 1440 by 900, which just makes everything way, way, way too small. So yeah, this is why Apple even defaults the resolution to 1680 by 1050, which yes, does make the text smaller and easier to read, but it also creates a bit of haze. So yeah, it's not as sharp. Now, I haven't really had any issues when it comes to the displays on the MacBook Pros. However, both my 5K 2015 iMac, as well as my LG UltraFine K 5K display, which used the exact same panel, by the way, they start experiencing severe burn-in issues after about two years or so. So do you keep that in mind? Since the 2019 iMacs used the exact same panel as the 2015 models, I do expect this to be an issue and to happen again in a few years, so I highly, highly recommend getting Apple Care. And speaking of monitors, if you go to Apple's spec sheet for both of these machines, uh, the MacBook Pro is listed to support two 5K displays at 60 Hz, while the iMac, interesting enough, is only listed to support one 5K display. And same thing for 4K displays, the iMac is listed to support up to two, while the MacBook Pro supports up to four 4K displays, which doesn't really make sense since, you know, the iMac is supposed to be the more powerful one, right? Well, yes. And it is. So I believe that the reason for this limitation is just in the number of Thunderbolt 3 ports. You know, with just two ports, you'll have a hard time connecting more than two 4K monitors unless you use an adapter or a dock. Uh, reason why Apple only has two listed. Now, in terms of 5K monitors, uh, this should be due to how Thunderbolt ports are connected to the logic board. So on the MacBook Pro 15 inch, if you want to connect, let's say two 5K monitors, you need to plug them in the opposite Thunderbolt 3 ports. So one on the left, uh, and then the other one on the right hand side of the machine. Otherwise, uh, there is not enough bandwidth to drive this displays. As the left hand side is connected to one Thunderbolt 3 controller and the right hand side is connected to a different Thunderbolt 3 controller. And on the iMac, since we already have one massive built-in 5K display already, uh, one more is really the maximum it can drive. So you might be able to connect another one, so that you have three in total with a built-in one, but it might not run at full 5K or at 60 frames per second. And finally, we have the performance. This is probably what you're all here for, and this is the section that I'm most excited to talk about. So the iMac 2019 has an Intel i9-9900K processor, which is a full desktop chip with eight cores and a clock speed of 3.6 gigahertz, which can go up to five gigahertz for turbo and a 16 megabytes level three cache. So uh, 
this thing is a monster. Now, the MacBook Pro has the Intel i9-9980HK processor, which is actually Intel's most powerful processor for a laptop. So we also have eight cores with a clock speed of 2.4 gigahertz up to the same five gigahertz turbo and a level three cache of also 16 megabytes. So yes, the CPUs do seem really, really similar. GPU wise, we have the AMD Radeon Vega 20 graphics with four gigabytes of HBM2 memory on the MacBook Pro versus the AMD Radeon Vega 48 graphics with eight gigabytes of HBM memory on the iMac. RAM wise, we have 32 gigabytes of 2400 megahertz DDR4 memory on the 15 inch MacBook Pro. Now this is non-upgradable. So you have to configure it with 32 gigabytes of RAM from Apple when you buy it, which really, really sucks. On the iMac, I only got the eight gigabytes model. However, the iMac is currently the only new Mac that actually allows you to officially and also easily upgrade the RAM yourself. So there's a tiny door that opens on the back of the iMac and you can put in your own RAM. Just make sure that you have the right specs for them. And this way, I've actually installed 64 gigabytes of 2666 megahertz memory. Yes, I've actually saved about 600 pounds by doing so myself. I've left a link in the description to the RAM that I've chosen. This is 100% compatible with this iMac and they work really, really great with no errors or anything like that. Okay, so now I've run a ton of bench marks on these over the past few weeks, each of them three times, and these were the final results. So in Geekbench 4 single core, the iMac was 1.12 times faster than the MacBook Pro, and then multi-core wise, we actually had the exact same 1.12 times improvement. So yeah, surprisingly, this wasn't that much of a difference at all. Also, both of them got a higher score than the eight core iMac Pro, and the iMac was actually very close to even defeating the 10 core iMac Pro. Then in Cinebench R20, the iMac was 1.23 times faster than the MacBook Pro, while in Cinebench R15, the iMac was 1.2 times faster. And then I also ran our 3D rendering test using Keyshot 8. So this is exactly the same as to how we render our concepts. Uh, and here the iMac was 1.6 times faster than the MacBook Pro was. The iMac did run at a much higher clock speed of 3.6 gigahertz versus just 2.5 on the MacBook Pro. Uh, but interesting enough, the temperatures were actually much lower on the MacBook Pro with 75 degrees on average versus 93 degrees on the iMac. I've actually noticed this on many different tests as well, how the MacBook Pro 2019 tends to keep the temperatures much lower than even the 2018 model, but also keeps the clock speeds lower uh, than they could go up to. Now, Considering the clock speeds of 2.4 gigahertz and 3.6 on the iMac, none of those have actually throttled below their base clock speed. So um, yeah, that's a, not bad. I wouldn't say pretty good, just not bad. Okay, so what about the GPU now? Well, in Geekbench 4 OpenCL Compute, the iMac's Vega 48 graphics was 1.88 times faster than the MacBook Pro's Vega 20. So there you go, a massive improvement there. Then in Cinebench R15, the iMac was only 1.16 times faster, but then when it comes to some proper 3D intensive apps, such as Unigine Heaven Benchmark, the iMac was again 1.85 times faster than the MacBook Pro. And then in Fortnite, the iMac was 3.33 times faster than the MacBook Pro. Uh, both were actually set to epic settings, but the iMac was even set uh, to 1920 by 1080 versus 1680 by 1050 on the MacBook Pro. So while the CPU difference isn't that great, the GPU inside the iMac is two to three times faster than the MacBook Pros. And then next up, I've run the software that I care about the most. And that is Final Cut Pro 10. So this is what I used to QC and export every single video. And here I had the OnePlus 7 Pro blind camera test. So uh, this was a 15 minutes 4K project full of picture in picture 4K clips, titles and effects. And first of all, uh, the timeline was so, so much smoother on the iMac, like using it, scrolling it, and just editing on the iMac was, was so much better than on the MacBook Pro. Uh, it was pretty much real time, even during the most demanding scenes. The playback was also really good on the MacBook Pro as well, definitely over 30 frames per second, but the iMac was rendering this at 60 frames per second all the time. So really, really impressive. And exporting this locally in H.264, and the iMac was 1.4 times faster than the MacBook Pro, so quite a big difference here. Next up, I have an even more complex project, our full 27 minute full review of the 2019 MacBook Pro 15 inch, so this one. Uh, so yeah, go watch it, it's our most detailed video yet. And the iMac was 1.2 times faster here as well. However, here's where it gets really, really interesting and unexpected. Exporting the same projects, but in H.265, uh, the iMac was actually slower than the MacBook Pro was, yes. In the first project, the iMac was 1.04 times slower uh, than the MacBook Pro, but then in the second project, the iMac was 1.47 times slower. Yes, a massive difference between the two. In fact, the 2019 iMac was even slower than my MacBook Pro 2018 at exporting H.265 video. Okay, but why, why is that? It doesn't make any sense. 
Well, even though the iMac is, you know, better spec in every single way, uh, the only thing that the iMac lacks that the MacBook Pro has is the T2 processor. This was something that was included in the iMac Pro, and now we have it on all the new Macs. The MacBook Pro 13 inch has it, the 15 inch, the MacBook Air, uh, the 2018 Mac Mini, even the brand new upcoming Mac Pro, they all have the T2 processor. So yeah, the only new Mac that doesn't have it is the 2019 iMac. There you go, this is why it's slower than the MacBook Pro at exporting H.265 video. Uh, since the uh, T2 processor does have a dedicated H.265 encoding hardware, which actually seems to work better than the Intel H.265 encoding hardware that's built into the 9900K processor. So yeah, that's, uh, that's really, really impressive. Now, in case you're wondering why the iMac Pro doesn't have the T2 chip, we don't really know for sure. Apple hasn't said anything, but my guess is that they wanted the iMac to just be a spec bump. That's it, just a CPU and GPU spec bump so that Apple would spend almost nothing on redesigning the builds or even the logic board, heavily at least. I mean, even the fan is the exact same one as in the previous 2015 iMac and the 2014 models. Yes, that single fan has remained unchanged even though we have an 8-core processor from the quad-core that we had years before. Uh, also, Apple still sells the Fusion Drive options for these iMacs, which is just ridiculous. Everything should be SSD and flash in 2019. Uh, and the T2 processor doesn't work with regular hard drives, which could be another strong reason. Regardless, if you do a lot of H.265 exports like we do, by the way, the iMac is actually going to be slower than even a 2018 MacBook Pro, uh, but only at exporting. So timeline fluidity is still incredible on the iMac. Also, another place where the MacBook Pro is faster than the iMac is when it comes to the disk speed test. So the MacBook Pro got one point four times higher write speeds and about the same read speeds than the iMac. This was with Firewall disk encryption enabled. And again, by having that T2 processor, which does handle the disk encryption, decryption in real time, uh, means that we can have higher read speeds and write speeds from the disk. Also, fun fact, uh, having the T2 chip also means that the new Find My app, which Apple will be launching with macOS Catalina, that allows you to locate the stolen Mac, uh, when it's not connected to Wi-Fi, will only work on the MacBook Pro. It will not work on the iMac. However, at least there are no T2 crashes on the iMac. Yes, my MacBook Pro crashed a lot, quite a lot. Check out the full review to learn more about that. But the iMac does not, doesn't have a T2 chip, so no more T2 crashes on the iMac. Okay, so since the GPU and the T2 chip are the biggest performance differences between the two, what happens if you use an external GPU on the MacBook Pro? Like, can we get even better performance on the MacBook Pro than on the iMac? Well, I've tried this. Uh, so here I have the Vega 64 GPU attached with an eGPU enclosure to my 2019 MacBook Pro. This is, by the way, the same GPU as in the highest end iMac Pro. And exporting the blind camera test took the MacBook Pro more than twice more than twice to export with the eGPU than without the eGPU. Uh, yeah, long story short, don't use an eGPU, at least not with Final Cut Pro 10, because at the moment you'll get weaker performance than by using the MacBook Pro's uh, dedicated GPU. You know, there, there's a big update, by the way, coming this fall uh, to Final Cut Pro 10, which should improve the eGPU rendering by a lot. But yeah, until then, it's, it's just not worth it. Also, another fun fact is that we get Bluetooth 5.0 on the MacBook Pro versus the old Bluetooth 4.2, uh, on the iMac. So yeah, if you use any Bluetooth headphones, the MacBook Pro is going to have a two times higher speed and four times the range of the iMac. Now, some of the apps that I was using for this performance test, such as iStat menus, for example, to measure the clock speed and temperatures and adjust the fans, well, they were, they were not free. In fact, they were quite pricey at £9.99 in the App Store. But if you use Setup, this video sponsor, you can get those apps and tons more, all chosen by Setup's members and their curation team for just $9.99 a month. So yeah, imagine it a bit like Netflix, except Mac apps instead of movies. Setup has over 150 apps that you can access anytime and anywhere you want. Apps like this drill that can recover lost data, Clean My Mac X, which frees up this space and protects your Mac, or Isted Menus, which I make sure to install install first on any Mac, any new Mac that I get, since it gives you a full in-depth look at what's taking up your system resources, temperatures, clock speed, fan speed, and everything else. The best part about Setup is that they offer a 7-day trial, so you can play around with all of those apps and 150 plus more before deciding to join. This alone is such a killer feature and makes Setup a worthy alternative to Apple's own Mac App Store. So it's a great way to test apps and then download and use a number of them, which would normally cost you hundreds or even thousands of dollars. So yeah, it quickly pays for itself. So yeah, give it a try using the link below as it's free to use for the first week. Okay, so in conclusion, which one is worth it the most? 
Well, if you need a laptop, something that's very powerful for you to do your work anywhere you are, then obviously get the MacBook Pro. In my case, I do need a laptop, so I would always pick a MacBook Pro over an iMac. So yeah, it's great to see that we finally have desktop class CPU performance, at least, uh, on such a thin and portable computer. But if you want the best performance for the cost, the iMac is actually the best Mac to get in terms of that. There's no iMac that offers more for the money. Um, and yes, it will cost you about $4,000, the, the version that I have, with the 64 gigabyte RAM upgrade. Again, link for that in the description. While the MacBook Pro will cost you $4,150, would have the RAM, a weaker CPU, a twice as weak GPU, and with no 5K monitor at all. Also, something to consider is that the iMac's design hasn't been updated since 2012 or even 2009, if you only take a look at the front, uh, while the MacBook Pro's design hasn't been updated since 2016. And we've actually seen many reports recently that both are actually getting a design very, very soon. So the MacBook Pro is getting a design in late 2019 with that 16 inch redesign. And the iMac is getting a redesign in 2020, so next year. So yeah, if you can wait, then just, just wait. If not, think of your workflow and what you really need. Do you need a powerful laptop that you can do, uh, on which you can do your work anywhere you are on the road? In that case, get a MacBook Pro. Uh, if you mostly work from your desk and need something even more powerful and the best bang for the buck in terms of Macs, then get the iMac. Remember that H.265 videos actually render faster on the MacBook Pro thanks to the T2 processor. But yeah, thank you for watching. Definitely do subscribe notifications if you want to see more in-depth tech videos and comparisons such as this one. Tap the bell icon so that you get notified whenever a brand new video comes out. So yeah, thank you for watching. Let me know in the comments what do you guys think. Which one would you pick, MacBook Pro or the iMac? In terms of sales, the MacBook Pro is doing so much better. So yeah, I think most people would actually choose the MacBook Pro. But let me know in the comments which one would you would you pick. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'm Daniel and I'll see you guys in the next one. Zenoftech, signing out. Cheers.